trying times, we could all use a little bit of levity, and what better place to find it than in crap wrestling? Good wrestling is fine as well and can help provide an escape, of course, but if laughter truly is the best medicine, then you can get a healthy dose by digging through the untidy archives of WCW. WCW was responsible for producing some of the greatest wrestlers, matches, and moments in the history of the business, but they were also responsible for some of the worst and seemed to specialize in unadulterated oddness. The history of WCW, whether it was the good old-fashioned tights and boots wrestling of the 1980s and early 90s, the Red Hot Company that beat WWE in the ratings for 83 weeks during the Monday Night Wars, or the dying self-parody of its final days, is full of wacky gimmicks that, almost 20 years on from the company closing its doors, are as unfathomable today as they were back then. Please pause your DVD of Ready to Rumble, crack open a can of Surge, relax and join me as I look back at the 10 absolute wackiest gimmicks to ever grace a WCW ring. Join us! Number 10. The Renegade WCW were nothing if not a company that were happy to rip off other, more successful ideas from other companies. See the NWO, Asia, and all of those pound shot Mortal Kombat lads. Fatality. Don't worry, there are more WCW ripoffs to come later. WCW were also nothing if not an organization that was happy to promise fans something, whether it was a match, stipulation, or indeed a particular wrestler, only to go back on themselves or simply not deliver it in the end. Add the two together and you get the Renegade, a face paint and tattoo wearing man with big hair and a chiseled physique who looks suspiciously, well, a bit like the Ultimate Warrior. Not so much the Ultimate Warrior as the Inferior Warrior, as this pale imitation had a tiny fraction of the kooky charisma of the original. Touted by Hulk Hogan as the ultimate surprise, the Renegade debuted in the Hulkster's Corner for the main event of WCW Uncensored 95 and continued to be associated with Hogan and Randy Savage before trying to make it on his own. He found some success and even defeated Arn Anderson for the television title at Great American Bash and registered victories over the likes of Paul Orndorff and the stunning but not quite stone cold Steve Austin. The problem was, the fans simply didn't care and recognized that the gimmick was a cheap knockoff of another much bigger and better star. The reactions got milder and milder, and eventually the renegade was taken off of television. When he did crop up, it was as a jobber on WCW's lesser shows like Saturday Night or WCW Pro. He managed to stay on the company's books until December 1998 when he was released. Sadly, the man who played renegade, Rick Wilson, would take his own life just a few months later. Number 9. The Kiss Demon Celebrities and wrestling are no strangers to one another, but in the late 90s, the business, especially WCW, started to resemble Saturday Night Live as much as a pro wrestling show, only with less star power and far fewer laughs. Whether it was Master P, Carmen Electra, or Jay Leno, Eric Bischoff and the boys at Turner were more than happy to throw cash at those in the mainstream, hoping that it would lead to extra publicity and generate interest. That was certainly the thinking when Bischoff entered into an agreement with the ultra-popular rock and roll band Kiss in 1999. See, frontman Gene Simmons wanted to create a stable of wrestlers that were dressed up in a similar style to the group and, incredibly, had it written into his contract with WCW that one of them would eventually main event a pay-per-view. Enter the Kiss Demon. Initially portrayed by Brian Adams before the man formerly known as Crush thought, hey, this is too stupid even for me, and later given to Dale Torborg, a WCW power plant trainee and diehard fan of the band. The Kiss Demon was supposed to enter a long and presumably dumb feud with Vampiro, which was due to culminate at a special New Year's Eve WCW pay-per-view slash KISS concert called New Year's Evil. Alas, the show never happened as Bischoff was fired for doing things like paying KISS $500,000 to perform a single song on Nitro, a segment that, incidentally, was one of the lowest rated in the show's history. Though Bischoff was gone and the character was considered dead on arrival, the company was still obligated to feature it on television and so the demon made a handful of further appearances on TV before quietly disappearing when WWE bought WCW. CW. Yes, I'm as shocked as you are that WWE didn't feel the need to bring him in for the invasion. Number 8. That 70s Guy and the Fat Chick Thriller Okay, so this is a double entry, and that means that technically there are more than 10 gimmicks in this list, but who are you to complain about an excess of content? Mike Awesome more than lived up to his name. The awesome part, that is, not Mike. As a tremendously agile and hardworking big man in ECW and in Japan, his matches with the likes of Masato Tanaka, Hayabusa, and even little Spike Dudley gaining rave reviews and establishing him as somebody to watch for the future. Given that he was around 6 foot 5, 300 pounds, and could do things that even some cruiserweights 
students couldn't manage, it wasn't going to be long before Awesome graduated from the bingo halls to the arenas. And so it came to be, as Awesome defected to WCW in acrimonious circumstances, he was still ECW champion at the time in the spring of 2000. That bridge well and truly burned, Awesome must have hoped that the jump down south would be worth it. Things got off to a promising start as he adopted the moniker of the career killer and feuded with premier stars like Kevin Nash and DDP. Oh, how it would quickly turn sour. Not long into that run, Awesome would turn from the career killer to the fat chick thriller. Ironic considering the character of a chubby chasing feeder was bound to ruin whatever career Awesome thought he could have in a company that was quickly spiraling towards the end. Once that terrible gimmick had run its course, Awesome was repackaged as that 70s guy, an attempt to capitalize on pop popular sitcom That 70s Show, complete with flares, bad hair, and a Partridge Family bus that he used to drive to the ring. Hardly Steve Austin on a Zamboni, is it? Both gimmicks were terrible and helped squander the mountains of potential that Awesome had. His career in the US never recovered thanks to this Vince Russo fever dream, which may or may not have been the result of Awesome's closeness with his cousin Horace Hogan and the fallout from the infamous Bash at the Beach 2000 incident. With Russo, it's hard to tell the difference between a vindictive punishment and genuine incompetence, you know? Number 7. Arachnaman, The Candyman, and B.A. Buzzkill Yes, we're immediately following up a double entry with a triple one, but I'm not sure you fully realize yet how incredible WCW was. Mike Awesome should have counted himself lucky for only being saddled with two perplexing personas and not three. The fate that befell Brad Armstrong, a member of the legendary Armstrong family and a hell of a worker who never quite achieved the heights his talent suggested he could. Rather than just keeping him as Brad Armstrong, good wrestler that has good wrestling matches with other good wrestlers, WCW decided to use him as a guinea pig for different guys which in the early 90s meant that they had to be kid friendly. The first of these was the Candyman, which was basically Armstrong in red and white striped tights handing out sweets to kids in the audience. It wasn't much of a role and gave off a rather weird vibe, sort of like that neighbor you weren't supposed to talk to when you played outside as a kid. Another wacky gimmick bestowed upon Armstrong was Arachnaman, a purple and gold clad not so superhero that looked a little bit like Spider-Man if you ordered him from Wish.com. Arachnaman didn't do much of note and only made a handful of television appearances before he was flushed down the drain because, believe it or not, Marvel Comics didn't appreciate the idea of some low-rent wrestling company using a character that lightly infringed upon their trademark cash cow and threatened legal action if they didn't immediately cease and desist. And finally, we get to B.A. Buzzkill, another winning Vince Russo creation that was meant as a rib on WWE's Road Dog. You know, that mega overact that sold a ton of merch and made Brian James, Brad's brother, a millionaire. Wearing tie-dye and sporting fake braids, this pathetic copy shockingly didn't get over, but must have led to some pretty interesting conversations at the Armstrong family Christmas dinner. Number 6. Oklahoma Vince Russo rightfully gets a lot of stick for the tidal wave of garbage that he has unleashed on the wrestling world. Hell, I just gave him some in those last two entries. But we must also not forget that another man deserves his share of scorn when it comes to birthing or enabling some of those ideas as well. That man is Russo's best and likely only friend, Ed Ferrara, who worked as a writer during the fruitful WWE Attitude Era and left with Russo to go to WCW in late 99. Without Vince McMahon and others to rein their ideas in, they were able to go all out with their inane creations and helped accelerate the demise of the second biggest wrestling company in the world. But fair play to Ed, who didn't just instruct others to portray gimmicks or play out mind-numbingly stupid storylines, but also joined in on the fun himself, depicting Oklahoma, not content with simply donning a black cowboy hat, aping his famous mannerisms, and affecting a southern accent, Ferrara as Oklahoma crossed a line when he continually mocked good old JR's Bell's palsy condition, which had led to the partial paralysis of the commentator's facial features. As well as being a WWE commentator, Ross was also then the head of WWE's talent relations, a gig that dealt with hirings, firings, fines, and so on. It was not a position that won him many friends and was clearly part of the reason for the Oklahoma character. Adding further insult, Oklahoma was seconded by Ross's longtime friend, Dr. Death Steve Williams, and pressing an extra nail into the coffin of World Championship Wrestling, he won the Cruiserweight title from Medusa in a match that definitely 100% actually happened. Number 5. The Ding Dongs 
For some, the name Jim Hurd is right up there with Ferrara and Russo when discussing the scale of professional wrestling ineptitude. The former Pizza Hut manager found himself executive vice president of WCW in the late 1980s because in wrestling you just fall upwards. And boy did he have some interesting ideas to turn around the floundering organization in order to compete with a WWE powerhouse that was selling out arenas around the world. For instance, why don't we take Ric Flair, fresh off of having a trilogy of some of the best matches ever with Ricky Steamboat. Cut his hair short, get rid of that silly nature boy gimmick, and christen him Spartacus, the Roman gladiator. Or what about the Hunchbacks, a team that physically couldn't have their shoulders pinned to the mat, and thus would never lose a match, presumably amassing a Goldberg-like winning streak? I know what you're thinking, what about submissions? And did that really get discussed as a viable thing to do? And is Jim Hurd currently in some sort of facility for the criminally insane? Those ideas thankfully never made it to television, but one of Hurd's genius inventions did. The Ding Dongs. The Ding Dongs, or Ding and Dong if you will, were a team that wore masks, full orange bodysuits with bells on them, and incessantly rang an actual bell while on the apron as a way to encourage the other to make a tag. WCW's blue collar fans hated the gimmick and immediately turned on the team. Commentating on their debut match, Jim Ross could hardly contain his disdain for what his beloved pro wrestling had become, ripping the act to shreds. The Ding Dongs only made a few televised appearances before promptly being jobbed out and removed from the roster. Now, let's never talk about them again. Number 4. Seven when you take stock of everything Dustin Rhodes has done and been through during a career that spans over 30 years, you simply have to marvel at his staying power. Now riding high as a key player in AEW, Dusty's son has weathered so many bad storylines and gimmicks that would have undoubtedly finished off lesser talents. One gimmick that never got off the ground but threatened to sink Rhodes while he was at a low point in his career was Seven, a character that was patterned after the bad guys from the recent neo-noir film Dark City. In reality, it looked more like Uncle Fester crossed with The Undertaker after a big night out. The character was supposed to be some sort of spooky supernatural being that could take the souls of children, but came across as something even more sinister. Regrettably, the whole setup of the vignettes hyping the character's debut made it look like Seven was actually a child abductor, because, you know, he was hanging around outside of a kid's window at night and saying weird stuff in a raspy voice like, Who is under your bed? Who is in your closet? Come with me to live forever. Turner's broadcasting standards and practices departments realized there was a big problem and put the kibosh on the character before he made his proper debut. Rhodes still made an elaborate entrance wearing the outfit, but dropped the act when he got in the ring, denouncing the gimmick as well as the Gold Dust character and the treatment he and his father had received in recent times. After the promo, the character was dead and Rhodes reverted to wrestling under his own name for the rest of his WCW tenure. Number 3. The Yeti one of the upshots of WCW hiring Hulk Hogan in 1994 was that he subsequently began getting jobs for his mates. Before long, guys like the former Brutus Beefcake, Earthquake, and Kamala would appear and feud with the Hulkster. Led by Kevin Sullivan, they called themselves the Dungeon of Doom and were hell-bent on destroying Hulkamania. In reality, they were a bunch of safe hands that Hogan felt comfortable working with, and their cheesy gimmicks like the Zodiac and the Shark were perfectly pants but certainly fit the era. After many failed attempts to rid the world of the red and yellow, Sullivan called upon the Giant, in storyline the son of Andre, to vanquish the WCW champion once and for all. As an insurance policy, the group claimed to have had a Yeti that had been frozen in a block of ice, waiting by in case Hulk's prayers and vitamins became too much. At the 1995 Halloween Havoc, the Yeti debuted at the culmination of the Hogan Giant main event, resembling not the abominable snowman, but a mummy. The Yeti walked to the ring covered in bandages and proceeded to grab Hogan from behind and hump him into submission. They can tell you it was a bear hug, but we all saw what happened. He was humping him. A dumb idea that was somehow even worse in its execution, the Yeti would swiftly disappear from television, returning sometime later dressed up in a ninja costume. Because if you're going to call somebody the Yeti, they may as well be a universal monster movie character or a Japanese martial arts expert. Either way. Number 2. Oz the great and powerful Kevin Nash had a hard time of it in WCW, having to endure a string of failing gimmicks like the Master Blaster and Vinnie Vegas, the tall and athletic former basketball standout paying his dues as a rookie in the wrestling business. The Meathead and Mobster were a far cry from the badass Diesel or the sarcastic hell-raising founding member of the NWO, but at least they weren't a character brought to life from an actual children's book. For a short time in 1992, Nash had the misfortune of being tasked with portraying Oz, complete with 
silver hair, terrifying old man mask, and dunce cap. What, with Thumper and Humpty Dumpty already taken? Imagine taking a young Braun Strowman and making him Clifford the Big Red Dog. Unbelievable. The Oz character was the brainchild of Jim Hurd and Dusty Rhodes, another attempt to appeal to a younger demographic while cross-promoting Turner's recently acquired MGM video library, which included The Wizard of Oz. There was a serious investment in the character, from the wardrobe to its debut entrance, which came complete with a castle, laser show, smoke, fireworks, and extras that were dressed as Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion. WCW fans reacted with just the right amount of hatred for the presentation, which was naff even by the dodgy standards of the time. Despite going on a winning streak and being pushed on TV, Oz was shelved soon after and Nash was repackaged. And you, Big Daddy Cool, we'll miss you most of all. Number 1. The Shockmaster you only get one chance to make a first impression, and in wrestling, a bad debut can sink a promising wrestler and destroy a character before it even has a chance to get over. Fortunately for Fred Ottman, the disastrous bow of the Shockmaster didn't matter too much in the long term, as the gimmick itself, what even was he supposed to be, had no hope of anything other than a long forgotten curio before he smashed through the wall at the 24th Clash of the Champions. The Shockmaster, basically just a big fat bloke in a glittery Stormtrooper helmet and black puffy vest, was supposed to be a major reveal, announced as the tag team partner of Sting, British Bulldog, and Dustin Rhodes for their upcoming War Games match, the headliner of Full Brawl. Crashing through a wall in what was meant to be a dramatic fashion, Ottman tripped on a piece of wood and, to quote Davy Boy Smith, who was trying to contain himself in the background, fell flat on his effing ass. His helmet off and potential WCW career almost certainly ruined, things got even weirder as he, actually Ole Anderson standing off camera, cut a threatening promo in a deep voice that was completely undermined by the fact that he just fell flat on his effing ass. WCW sensibly got rid of the helmet and replaced it with a much more sensible hard hat for future appearances. Astonishingly, the Shockmaster actually got the win in the War Games match, though Ottman was only permitted to perform one solitary move, a simple bear hug, probably for fear that he might fall through the cage at any moment should he attempt anything else. 